This is the day that the Lord has made and we have a right reason and responsibility to rejoice and be glad in it. How grateful to God we are for this opportunity to grow in God's word together. As you may or may not know, we have been trekking through the seven final, the seven last statements or sayings of Christ as he suffered on the cross. And tonight we will take a look at statement number five. But first, let's pray and ask God's blessings upon our time together. Shall, shall we pray? Father, how we thank you for this another opportunity that you have given us to grow in your word, to glean from your word. Father, I do pray that you would fashion our hearts to be the fertile soil wherein the seed of your word can be planted to produce fruit that will last and be pleasing to you. I pray now that the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart will be acceptable in thy sight. Lord, you are my strength and you are my redeemer. This we ask in the name of your son, Jesus, our Christ. Amen. Tonight, we are looking at statement number five, as I've already mentioned. And if you would, why don't you grab your copy of God's word? Join me in the gospel according to St. John chapter 19. John chapter 19. And I want to look at verses 28 and 29 of John chapter 19 from the New American Standard Bible. And this is how it reads. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished, to fulfill the scripture said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. 
So they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. If I had to tag tonight's lesson uh, with a topic or a title, here's, here's how I would tag it. I'll drink to that. That's, that's what I want to teach on tonight. I'll drink to that. I know many of you may not know this because you are uh, saved, saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. You are heaven bound, and I'm so excited for you. Uh, but as others of us may know, in culture, achievement and accomplishment is often celebrated by the consumption of alcohol. Uh, for those of you who have spent at least a little time in the world, you may have heard the phrase or the terminology popping champagne. It, it, it is a time of celebration for a major milestone being accomplished. Typically, typically when something amazing happens, like getting a job or getting a promotion at a job, getting a raise or closing a big deal, anytime something amazing happens, it is celebrated by gathering and drinking together. Even at wedding receptions, uh, when the best man or when the maid of honor make their speeches, their, their speeches are often culminated with a toast. They, they'll raise a glass and, and they'll make a toast to, to the bride and groom. And, and, when, and when we look at Calvary, when we look at Christ's suffering on Calvary, it may seem like there's not much to celebrate. Here's Jesus on the cross, the same Jesus who healed diseases, cast out devils, provided food to the hungry, raised the dead, brought them back to life, transformed lives by his words. This Jesus is now helpless and defenseless on a cross. He's treated as a criminal. His enemies are having a field day with him. And even one of the people being crucified next to him have the audacity to mock and insult him. It doesn't seem like much to celebrate. However, don't you think, don't you dare think for one second that Jesus is some weak chump on this cross. No, when we see Jesus on the cross, we're not seeing him as a chump. When Jesus is on the cross, he's on the cross as a champion. How do we know? Because according to scripture, the text says, after this, Jesus knowing all things had already been achieved, knowing all things had already been accomplished to fulfill scripture said, I thirst. Just like in culture, Christ celebrated accomplishment with a drink. But you might wonder if that is the case, what is there to celebrate in this moment? I, I want to offer and recommend three propositions that I believe the text itself reveals to us as to why Jesus could celebrate and why we can celebrate in this particular moment. First of all, I, I, I believe that it's worth celebrating when you consider Jesus' submission. We, we ought to celebrate his submission. The last time we hear Jesus speak of drinking or, or, or speak in terminology of of drinking something. It, it was in the garden. Remember when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, he prayed to the father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. In this moment, Jesus was in deep anguish as it pertained to his impending death. And though he knew exactly what his mission was, it didn't make the reality of it any easier. And friends, I, I, I want to offer tonight that submission to God's will is no easy thing. No, it's not. Submission to God's will is no easy thing. Sometimes submission requires discomfort. It requires sacrifice. It requires pain. It requires loss. It even requires loneliness. And obviously, no one signs up for any of these things. Obeying the will of the Father does have its perks. Make no mistake about it. I don't want to make it seem like serving God is just some drastic, depressing experience. No, not at all. Obeying the will of the Father has its perks, but it also has its pain. And this is what Jesus was faced with. He was faced with the reality of crucifixion and he followed through. 
Listen, y'all, submission to God doesn't require approval or agreement. It, it really only requires action. You, you can do what God tells you to do and not be sure about it. You can do what God tells you to do and not necessarily like it. You can do what God tells you to do and not necessarily approve of it because submission to God's will doesn't require your approval, doesn't even require your agreement. It just requires that you act on his will. It is said that during the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln met with a group of ministers for a prayer breakfast. And one of the ministers said, Mr. President, let's pray that God is on our side. President Lincoln responded, no, gentlemen, let's pray that we are on God's side. And that's what we have to understand about submission. Submission to God is not about getting God to yield to our plans. It's actually about God getting us to yield to his plans. And it takes great strength to be on God's side when you consider what being on his side comes with. And in this moment, we see Jesus submitted to the will of the Father. As painful of an experience as it was, as, as much toil and as much tribulation and as much stress, Jesus knew he would encounter by following through with this commitment. He still followed through. And I want to suggest, friends, I know I know, I know you want to live in humility, but I don't think there's anything wrong with celebrating any moment in which you follow through with God's will, because following God's will ain't always easy. And so when we look at this moment, we can celebrate. We can celebrate submission. We can celebrate the fact that Jesus knew exactly what the will of the father was. And as hard and as difficult as it may have been, he submitted and he followed through. But what else is there to celebrate? When we look at this moment, when Jesus is suffering on this cross, literally dying, what can we celebrate? Here's another thing we can celebrate. We can celebrate strength. We can celebrate his strength. This is the first time that Jesus received a drink while on the cross. But it's not the first time he was offered one. Matthew and Mark's account reveals another occasion in which Jesus refused a drink. It was, it was wine mixed with myrrh. Jesus chose not to partake of this first drink because its mix served as a sort of sedative that would have numbed Jesus to the pain that he was experiencing. However, he accepts the sour wine in this instance. Jesus has been beaten severely. His flesh has been torn. His muscles have been weakened. His bones have been bruised. But he accepts this drink. And as far as we know, this is the first drink he has had in at least 15 hours. The last recorded drink we know Jesus partook, partook in was the Thursday before when he supped with his disciples for the last time. He took wine. Remember, he took the cup. He gave thanks. And he told his disciples, drink ye all of it. It represents the blood of the new covenant. This is, this is the last time we know of, based on what is recorded in scripture, it's the last time we know of that Jesus had a drink. And here it is some 15 hours later, and he has another. This is after he has endured all the pain of being beaten, being flogged, being nailed, his flesh being torn, and his energy is at an all-time low. He is physically drained and weak. Yet, he musters up the fortitude to utter five other statements before this one, or four other statements before this one, and now he makes this statement, I'm thirsty, and after this statement, he's going to make another statement. <laughs> and according to scripture, he didn't die. He gave up the ghost. He did die, but, but he died on his own terms. He gave up the ghost. He, he died on his own terms. What are you trying to say? God gave Jesus a supernatural strength to accomplish his assignment. And the truth is, 
It is impossible to achieve God's will without having God's strength. Listen, y'all, there's nothing. I don't care what you say. I don't care what you think. There is nothing that God calls you to do that is reasonable for you. No, it ain't. There's absolutely, if it's reasonable for you, it ain't God. There's absolutely nothing that God will call you to do that is reasonable for you. There's nothing that God calls you to do that you can just do independent of his strength and his might and his power. You need God to please God. Let me pause, rewind, and say that again. You need God to please God. And here we see Jesus operating in a strength that could only be ascribed and accredited to the supernatural power of God. You need God's strength to do what it is he's assigned you to do. One, one New Year's Day in the Tournament of Roses Parade, a beautiful float suddenly sputtered and it quit. The whole parade was held up until someone could get a can of gas so that the float could press forward in the parade. The ironic and amusing thing was that this float represented the Standard Oil Company. With all of its vast resources, this float represented the gas company, but didn't even have enough gas to do what it needed to do. What I'm trying to tell you, friends, is that if you are going to represent God in whatever you're doing, you're going to need his strength and supply to do whatever it is you're doing for him. And in this moment, we can celebrate the fact that Jesus was strong enough to die. He died on his own terms because God gave him the strength to endure and to adequately achieve what he had been assigned to do. We can celebrate submission in this moment. We can celebrate strength in this moment. But finally, I want to offer to you that in, in the event, in the case that you think there's nothing worth celebrating as you consider Jesus suffering on this cross, let me give you one final thought. We can celebrate sovereignty. As we look at Jesus in this moment, we can celebrate the sovereignty of God. Listen to the text. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished. Everything about Calvary was according to plan. Jesus suffered exactly the way he was supposed to at the pace he was supposed to. He didn't die before he got a chance to say all he needed to say or do all that he needed to do, which means even while on the cross, he was still in control. Man, even while on the cross, he was still in control. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had been accomplished, said, I'm thirsty. He was still in control, even while on the cross. Friends, listen to me. God's sovereignty over our lives is worth celebration. And this moment where we see Jesus on the cross is proof positive that God is in control, even when others think they are. God is in control, even when you think you are. God is never caught off guard. He is never blindsided. He is always in control. Growing, growing up, one of my favorite shows to watch was Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And if you're familiar, you know, he had a segment of his show where he would go to the land of make-believe. And in the land of make-believe were these characters, these, these puppets that served as characters in, in the land of make-believe in, in Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. But behind the scenes, what, what you don't see, when you're watching it, you just see the puppets. But behind the scenes, what you don't see is that there is someone with their hand in the puppet. So, so when the puppet is moving and, and, and when the puppet is motioning as if it is talking, it's because there's a hand in the puppet making it move. There's also a voice that you 
don't know where it's coming from. That's that's providing a voice for the pup, pup, uh, for the puppet, excuse me. But even when it comes to the hand that is inside of the puppet, manipulating and moving the puppet, and even when it comes to the voice that is providing a voice for the puppet, what you also need to consider is that everything that the hand in the puppet and the mouth for the puppet is doing is according to a script that that person didn't write. The person controlling the puppet and giving a voice to the puppet is following a script that someone else wrote. And I need you to understand that when we find Jesus on Calvary's cross, nothing happens outside of the script that God prepared. Judas betrayed Christ, but it was a part of the script. Jesus' garments were torn and, 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 and were divided, but even that was a part of the script. Even the drink they offered Jesus was a part of the script. And this is what makes this moment so beautiful. It is a reminder that nothing catches God by surprise because nothing happens outside of his script. I don't know who needs to hear that, but you need to know that if Calvary teaches us nothing else, it ought to remind you and encourage you that there is nothing that happens around you or to you that is outside of God's script. And if it's in God's script, that means he's in sovereign control over it. He's in control even when it doesn't seem like it. So when we consider Calvary, and particularly this moment on Calvary's cross, let us not view this moment as if Jesus is losing. No, no, no. Calvary was a win. This is achievement here. This is accomplishment here. He submitted, Jesus did, submitted to the will of the Father. He was strengthened to fulfill the assignment thoroughly. And in the midst of all that transpired, God was still in complete control. And because of this, we should celebrate his submission. We should celebrate his strength. We should celebrate his sovereignty because through that, we can celebrate salvation. Now I drink to that. Father, thank you so much that Calvary was not you losing, but you achieving. We thank you that you did not die as a chump. You died as a champion. And as we reflect and we remember Calvary, we do so in celebration. We celebrate your submission. We celebrate your strength. We celebrate your sovereignty. Thank you for what you accomplished on our behalf. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you. God keep you. I love you. Have a great one.